Hello, and thank you for listening to my second talk on shrimp bioflock aquaculture systems. Uh, my name is Taras Viktorovich Pleskin, and this is a rehearsal of my upcoming defense of my technical paper for my graduation from University of Florida's online aquaculture master's degree program. Uh, my program and specific subject of study is the optimization of shrimp bioflock aquaculture systems, specifically uh, Lidopinaeus vanime, through the deployment of various photosynthetic microbes. Thank you for listening to my talk, and let's begin. The prevailing incubus for this study and this talk is the imperative that the United States, along with a lot of other nations that consume shrimp and other seafood products, need to start shrimp farming. They need to start producing these seafood products themselves. Uh, for the most part, especially in the United States, wild shrimp fisheries of the Gulf species are very seasonal. They're exploitative of both labor and the wild resource. They're limited in the amount of product that they can produce and they thus makes that product very expensive due to that limited limit, uh, availability. Over 80% of the shrimp consumed in the United States every year is imported from Asia and Latin America. A growing percentage of that is from Asia due to the cheaper labor. And the fact that uh, we are purchasing so much of this shrimp from foreign sources uh, has obvious logistical compromises with the quality of the shrimp being consumed by Americans. Uh, this shrimp is of extreme lower quality than the quality that would be enjoyed in the production nations and in other nations, let's say in Japan and China, where as in the United States, uh, only uh, rare, really expensive crustaceans like Dungeness crab or American lobster are prepared and then cooked uh, alive. Uh, Shrimp in many of these other Asian nations are treated a very similar way, where premium shrimp is kept alive up until the point where it is prepared. Um, and thus, uh, that is a far cry from the average product consumed even at the most expensive of American restaurants, where the products are arrive frozen, headless, um, and because they do not have that head, uh, they don't have any of the flavor provided by the hepatopancreas and the other organs. and because uh, these shrimp have been shipped for long periods of times, uh, often stored for weeks, if not sometimes months on end, uh, there's also the need to employ preservatives such as sodium triphosphate, sodium tripolyphosphate, et cetera. And though these compounds are not necessarily toxic, uh, they certainly uh, rob the, the shrimp of its raw uh, natural umami flavor. Um, thus, anyone that consumes a fresh shrimp with its head on um, and then consumes a frozen, headless, deveined uh, shrimp, uh, it's like two completely different uh, delic uh, gourmet experiences altogether. Um, and another eventuality of this relationship that America has where it purchases all of its shrimp from foreign nations that takes months and weeks on end is a very limited amount of market species that Americans enjoy. Uh, we don't eat the wide variety of shrimp that are available uh, worldwide. Instead, we pretty much eat uh, Panaeus monodon, the tiger prawn, and even that, not so much these days as little Panaeus vaname has widely uh, become the most popular and widely consumed shrimp in America, uh, being purchased en masse in the frozen, uh, already peeled, deveined form. Uh, the United States will buy over 500,000 uh, metric tons uh, for $3 billion of this uh, pretty inferior shrimp product every year. Um, and we are obligate to pay this uh, lower quality uh, product. Quick photo of me looking pretty psyched while I was in college because I took the train all the way from Rhode Island up to Boston to Chinatown acquired some really uh, sweet Panaeus monodon to the left, uh, really fresh, and uh, little Panaeus vaname with the head on uh, over to the right. And uh, for the first time in a while, able to enjoy actual shrimp tasting like actual shrimp. 
There are many uh, insurmountable challenges when it comes to conventional shrimp production in the United States. Conventional shrimp culture requires uh, ponds, either of an artificial nature or more traditionally, uh, more earthen ex uh, extensive nature. Um, but basically uh, we lack uh, tropical climate to sustain these highly tropical estuarine pinnated shrimp species. Uh, even the slightest dip in temperature uh, into the low 70s can prove absolutely calamitous to high density cultures of these shrimps. Uh, when I was studying in the Philippines, even they will not uh, necessarily grow shrimp year round in the northern sections of that country, even with its extremely tropical climate. Um, other challenges that cannot be avoided when it comes to the United States developing its aquaculture at large, let alone uh, conventional shrimp ponds, land rights. We have a lot of landowners on the coast, um, frankly impossible, especially with environmental regulations. Uh, conventional shrimp ponds have too much uh, water discharge and rely on way too much water discharge in interaction with the wild environment, um, let alone the fact that little Pinaeus vaname and monodon are not native and they would be uh, introducing foreign species with all of the diseases associated into American waters, no, no good. Um, and frankly, the sourcing of coastal land is pretty impossible to do at scale at this moment in the United States. There's also a lack of specialization, uh, no major shrimp hatcheries, uh, no major feed mills or processors. There are some scattered throughout the United States, but nothing that even pales in comparison to the equivalents, let's say in Japan, China, Philippines, Indonesia, Australia, or uh, even the equivalents in the United States when it comes to these things for chickens, pigs, and cows. Um, so the United States is completely a fledgling uh, in terms of its shrimp aquaculture capabilities. Um, and because of that, uh, this manifests in a very broad lack of consumer recognition for overall shrimp quality in the United States market. Most consumers couldn't really recognize any different species of shrimp. It's all fairly homogenized, mislabeled, and uh, certainly uh, there's very uh, little appetite um, traditionally in the American diet for a head-on shrimp. However, these things are rapidly uh, changing as Americans are realizing the true health, true flavor, and true nutrition they've been missing out on uh, by throwing away those heads this whole time. Quick example of a traditional shrimp pond I saw while I was studying in the Philippines. You can see it's highly integrated into the natural environment. It's formed almost its own pastoral ecosystem uh, in the landscape, but this is simply not possible uh, in the U.S. for a variety of uh, reasons stated. An example of a less extensive, less naturalized, and more intensified, more planned out um, shrimp farming system in the Philippines, same company, feed mix specialists. Um, you can see here a central channel where water is able to be uh, entered and discharged out from uh, the outside environment into the various production ponds. That's something that would be simply uh, not allowed. You could never build such infrastructure in the United States, um, at least not uh, anywhere that I'm familiar with. Another slight variation uh, from the Philippine model, you see the amount of laborers, workers, employees that are always present, always stationed on the farm at all times, simply a level of commitment that is economically uh, and socially uh, unfeasible in the United States. A more intensified, uh, modernized shrimp farm where you see it's no longer earthen, but using a plastic liner for highly intensified shrimp production. Uh, again, uh, something that foreseeably is possible in the United States, but still uh, very difficult to do at scale, uh, albeit maybe in some of the southern regions such as Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada, um, but still uh, certainly would not have the luxury of interacting with a wild water body um, where these tropical shrimp uh, are used to living in the first place. Quick example of a hatchery present in the Philippines where you already have this established hatchery infrastructure filled with these brood stock. Certainly we do have a few hatchery outfits in the United States, a couple in Florida and a couple other states, 
but uh, you would need a lot of these are constantly producing large amounts of seed in order to have nearly the kind of production needed to satiate even a small fraction of the American market. So if conventional shrimp aquaculture is impossible in the United States, then uh, the imperative remains that we still must produce shrimp in order to alleviate at least a partial fraction of our seafood de deficit. We must embrace a non-conventional form of cultivation if we are to succeed with shrimp. And fortunately, that technology has come in the form of bioflock technology, which does allow United States shrimp production to become economically and socially feasible. This is adapted from Hargreaves et al. 2013, because I like the way they sum it up. Um, but bioflock te technology, it's a, it's a system of limited water exchange in which utilizes a diverse microconsortium. Everything that is in that estuarine mangrove water in which Lidopineus vanime evolved in in the first place. Everything from the ciliates to the microalgae, the bacteria, the archaea, the marine fungi, everything. But in, whereas most aquaculture uh, production systems, especially recirculation aquaculture systems, take uh, all this biological activity and eliminate it through the forms of uh, solids filtration, chemical filtration with ozone, UV sterilization, etc., cetera, bioflock bio technology embraces this microbial diversity and seeks to course it towards a benign nature so that this microbial uh, consortium takes uh, in the waste from the production species like the shrimp and replenishes the water quality, recycling the waste and uneaten feed and replenishing this into a supplemental form of nutrition available for the market species. Uh, long story short, it is uh, a form of aquaculture technology, which is extremely water and feed conservative by its very nature. And to achieve those goals, it depends on biological complexity and things that mirror uh, microbial ecologies which exist in nature. Example of a shrimp bioflock production facility where you can see these are stationary tanks with minimalized plumbing, minimalized supplemental filtration, uh, certainly uh, strange from the complex, uh, highly uh, technologically invested uh, recirculation aquaculture systems that are more popular in other parts of the country. Uh, Bioflock systems are uh, simplified uh, by their very nature, um, relying on those microbial naturalized processes rather than mechanical expensive inputs. Bioflock technique is incredibly complex, um, albeit despite the fact that there is a uh, minimalized technolo technological input, there is an extreme amount of nuance to uh, setting up and cooking the right soup, um, if you pardon the expression. But a few key tenets to guiding uh, bioflock technique can, uh, can be described below. Uh, the first is that your microbial and macro community composition is absolutely paramount. Uh, to both the design and potential success and weaknesses of your bioflock production system. Uh, for, firstly, and most importantly, is the market species. Uh, in this circumstance, it will probably be shrimp, but there might also be other tertiary organisms. Uh, polychaete worms uh, are faced over to the right. Um, and you will basically have to uh, have your bioflock ecology designed around this market species, all the way from its baseline level, uh, all the way up to uh, the market species itself, starting with the inoculant, uh, which is various microbes, fungi, archaea, um, and these are going to have various operative faculties. Uh, some will be heterotrophs, eating organic carbon, uh, modulating that. Some will uh, be consuming uh, nitrogenous waste and the like and extracting energy that way, providing a biofilter function. Um, and then some will be photosynthetic, uh, which will be mainly uh, what we'll be discussing today and modulate a role in between the two. Um, there will also be grazers, things like copepods, nematodes, ciliates, protozoans, all these that are extremely important for uh, collecting uh, the smaller 
uh, microbes that absorb the waste and the chemicals from the water and then bioaccumulating all that nutrition up into essentially bigger critters that the fish, uh, shrimp can then uh, regraze on and then acquire that nutrition. Um, things that guide uh, this microbial interaction and of course the health and growth rates of the shrimp are things uh, such as temperature and the like, but also the carbon to nitrogen ratio. This is paramount to understand uh, that the ratios of organic carbon and nitrogen greatly dictate the general metabolic behavior of the bioflock microbial community. And it is paramount to being able to observe and being able to measure, quantify, and control and manipulate the carbon nitrogen ratio. Uh, usually, uh, we're going to be trying uh, to modulate this all within the context of also the amount of sediment and suspended particles that are going to be available in the bioflock system. That will be a representation of that carbon nitrogen ratio but at the same time represent their own confounding factors as far as providing more surface area for microbes, blocking light for photosynthetic microbes, etc. So there's a lot of different things to keep in mind. And of course, uh, how we're going to modulate the carbon and nitrogen sources. Uh, not all sources are equal. Molasses uh, does not equal cellulose, does not equal chicken feathers, etc. Um, so there's a lot going on with bioflock technique, but if you set up the right soup, you create something extremely powerful uh, extremely economically efficient and something that can produce a tremendous amount of, uh, of nutritious shrimp. The market species we will be producing is the Pacific white-legged shrimp, Little Panaeus vaname. It is the most aquacultured Panaea shrimp in the world. This is because it has a variety of highly desirable production characteristics. Um, it is elastic to salinity, so there are many countries that are salt limited that love to produce these guys as low as 10 ppt and sometimes even lower um, with some compromises. Um, however, they do have very strict temperature requirements. They cannot uh, get too cold. If they go into, let's say, the low 70s, it will quickly make them susceptible uh, to a variety of pathogens and uh, decrease their growth rate. Um, there are a variety of things that will go along, uh, wrong very quickly. Um, things that they have over uh, Panaeus monodon, the tiger prawn, why they surpass them in popularity nearly everywhere is because they are non-cannibalistic. Um, they are far less meat eaters. They are able to eat particulate matter, which makes them highly attractive to bioflock systems because they can reacquire the particulate matter from the bioflock itself. Um, and they don't require as much protein as well, which makes their feed considerably cheaper. Um, in addition, they have an extremely rapid growth rate. Um, from the time that they hatch, go to the Nopplia, Zoea, uh, post-larval state, all the way to harvest uh, can be upwards of only you know, five, six to nine months on um, this entire process, depending on how optimized the production system is. Um, that being said, demand for the species uh, is ever increasing, and there are limitless avenues to optimize the cultivation of the species, achieve lower FCRs and higher stocking densities, higher survival rates, etc. Quick graph from the FAO um, describing the demand for little Peneus vaname. As you can see, it's very starkly ever rising, and not only in the United States, but elsewhere. So areas that are natural producers of little Peneus vaname uh, will have to come, um, will only have so much production capability and the price will increase, thus making it ever more desirable for uh, non-conventionally producing shrimp nations such as the United States to get some skin into the game, so to speak. The market species, in this case being Little Panaeus vaname, directly dictates and contextualizes the environmental parameters we're going to be setting up for our bioflock. Uh, dissolved oxygen, we're going to have it to be at least more than 4.5. We can achieve that through a variety of, of methods, uh, direct liquid oxygenation, aeration with blowers, uh, most cheap option, and of course, uh, micro bubble technology as well has some significant promise. Temperature is going to meet be able, need to be maintained at the, that high level so that they will always be able to um, have a fast growth rate, making the system economically viable, and that also increases with disease resistance. Salinity has the most leeway, um, though that does have certain pros and cons when it comes to cost 
and uh, in final products, um, nutritional profile, taste profile, and uh, and end value. Alkalinity, magnesium, and calcium are examples of these trace elements that have to be balanced and observed, not only for optimizing the shrimp's metabolism, but for contextualizing and guiding the microbial uh, activity of the flock itself. Uh, the pH, again, will uh, something that can remain a little relatively plastic as long as it's not undergoing extremely stark and acute uh, changes. Um, total suspended solids. Um, again, you don't want too little or too much. Uh, a few studies that I read suggest that 400 to 600 parts per million is a good good way to balance uh, the need for some of these photosynthetic microbes to have some light while at the same time uh, reconcile the fact that the flock itself is uh, a, a turbine-driven system. The carbon nitrogen ratio, six to one, uh, this is something which will uh, keep the system in a largely heterotrophic uh, light, which will um, be able to keep the bioflock operational, though this can certainly be debated depending on how much photosynthetic activity we want to uh, promote. Um, nitrogenous wastes will have to be suppressed, um, even though the shrimp are relatively uh, resistant compared to some fin fish. Uh, the biofiltration capacity of the bioflock is integral to uh, maintaining uh, order over these nitrogenous wastes that can uh, cause acute toxicity to the shrimp sulfur-based wastes uh, as well. Um, and then illumination, lighting, uh, is possibly the most interesting and confounding consideration when it comes to uh, bioflock. Obviously, the question right off the bat is whether or not to light or not to light. Um, this would keep the system uh, in a complete heterotrophic uh, state, obviously remove the cost of even having lighting as a consideration. Um, but at the same time, you remove all the possible benefits that comes with having an active photosynthetic community in the flock itself. So there comes the question, are you going to have raw natural sunlight, i.e. through a greenhouse? Are you going to have uh, LEDs with a controlled spectrum, photoperiod intensity? Um, to what degree are you willing to reconcile cost with control over the light and illumination? And what are the pros and cons? And that largely depends on the photosynthetic community that is present in the flock itself, which this uh, study itself uh, endeavors to establish some criteria on uh, evaluating. The figure uh, you can see to the bottom right is a classical transition in a bioflock community. Um, as feeding rates increase through the production cycle. You start with a largely photosynthetic, uh, in this case, uh, green algae driven community, and you can see it's going into a brown, mostly heterotrophic bacterial driven community uh, by the end of the production cycle. And there's much that can be done to um, reconcile uh, this, uh, this process and um, you know, a lot of uh, debate to see which microbial community, which color, on the on the chart is quote best for any particular part of that Linopinaeus spanime production cycle. Introducing some of the different taxa of the photosynthetic microbes we'll be discussing. The green algae, the first off, the chlorophytes, they are mostly responsive to the red spectrum of light. They are very reminiscent in their photosynthetic apparatus as land plants. Um, just like land plants, they are ravenous consumers of nitrates and phosphates, organic carbon and uh, carbon dioxide. Um, however, some do have these thick indigestible cellulose-based uh, cell walls uh, that should be taken into consideration for both the resistance being grazed by uh, other critters like ciliates and the, the shrimp itself. Um, some notable uh, genera that I've worked with um, are Tetrasalmus. Um, specifically the species Chui and Striata. These are widely used in shellfish hatcheries, um, notably because of their lack of a highly uh, indigestible cell wall and their high uh, cholesterol, sterol content, and uh, PUFA content as well. Uh, another very important species, uh, I mean genera of note, is Nanochloropsis, uh, extremely widely used in green water or larva culture uh, for various marine finfish species. The golden algae. Uh, notable examples include the famous uh, strains T. isochrysis latia, Pavlova lutheri. Uh, these strains of microalgae have been quintessential for developing modern aquaculture because of their 
uh, ability to deliver extremely small digestible sources of polyunsaturated fatty acids to early marine finfish larvae, uh, thus making uh, dozens of marine finfish and shrimp uh, possible to be cultured in hatcheries at industrial scale. Um, they respond mainly to light in the blue spectrum um, because they do have those brown pigments. They are a very small size. Uh, they are very notable for their ability to synthesize and accumulate extremely high concentrations of polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, and because of that, they are an extremely promising alternative to wild caught fish oil. Um, if it is thought that they can be produced at a large enough scale, uh, then wild caught fish oil, uh, they will have their own, um, the, they will produce uh, eventually be a lower economic cost. And then we can have algae based feeds, uh, which many species prove uh, relatively receptive to, uh, Vaname being one of them. Uh, the major drawback to the golden algae, especially these two species, is that they are very easily uh, grazed on by ciliates, rotifers, copepods, and very easily outcompeted by other algae like the chlorophytes and diatoms. So their direct application uh, may be somewhat limited, uh, present in the flock itself, but um, injected at a large enough scale, they could be an effective way to uh, inject large concentrations of uh, PUFAs at will into the bioflock culture. The diatoms. Uh, these also react to light in the blue spectrum with their brown pigments. Uh, they are characterized by their ability to biomineralize silica shells, little mini greenhouses around their cells. These tests are able to allow them to photosynthesize in an extremely nuanced and highly efficient way compared to other microalgae. Uh, they are also able to process carbon in highly complex and nuanced ways, so they are far less uh, carbon limited than other algae, giving them some advantage in that regard. Um, they are known to form um, various long connected change and superstructures using these tests, uh, whereas these structures can either be a couple cells to a couple million cells long. Um, they also have an ability to produce and store an extreme variety of nutritional compounds, including many of those, uh, including and excluding. Um, all those produced by the other two uh, taxa of microalgae mentioned before. Um, but the major drawback is that they do require this sodium metasilicate supplementation in order to form their glass shells and do their magic. And this can constitute a considerable production cost at scale, um, especially when uh, arguably other species might have similar performances. Um, and then some genera of note, uh, Catoceros and Thalassoria, these are relatively small, albeit the Alsoria is bigger, um, diatoms that are really rich in PUFAs and relatively tolerant and adaptable to uh, salinity within uh, Vaname's uh, range. The purple non-sulfur bacteria, uh, being members of the alpha proteobacteria, they're direct relatives of conventional biofilter species, such as the ammonia uh, consuming nitrosomonas and the nitrite consuming nitrobacter. Um, but these uh, purple non sulfur bacteria uh, have their own superpowers in a way. Uh, they have what I describe as a Swiss army knife metabolism because they are capable of switching uh, uh, in between so many different faculties uh, depending on what environment they're exposed to. Uh, whether or not it's fresh or salt, uh, light or dark, or whether or not they're, they're exposed to oxygen or not, that greatly dictates their ability to conduct um, all or many or only some of the above uh, activities, uh, such as photosynthesis, nitrification, denitrification, anamox, diazotrophy, phosphate solubilization, and secretion of antibiotics. Uh, and because they are so adaptive to a wide array of environmental conditions, you know, you can have the same strain of Rhodopseudomonas palustris operating inside the water column of a bioflock system, and it could be completely operating completely differently than, let's say, one that's inside the, the inner sediment at the bottom of the same production system. Um, and what's even more fascinating is that many of these alpha proteobacteria, particularly uh, some of the species mentioned above, are naturally occurring gut pro probiotics inside the guts of many animals, including Lidopineus vanamae, and that some of uh, these microbes 
have been extracted from little Pinaeus vaname and then redeployed as effective feed-driven probiotics. With these photosynthetic taxa in mind, we will start to evaluate the criteria of an ideal bioflock agent, at least in my mind. Uh, the first uh, being biofiltration capacity, the ability to maximize all of our water to make sure that the water is clean, recycled, and that can be used for as long as possible, and that when it is disposed, it requires uh, the minimal amount of pro additional processing to make sure that it's environmentally safe to do so. Um, the second is the nutritional content uh, that the bioflock agent delivers to the flock itself um, so that we can maximize our feed efficiency, have all that waste uh, feed uh, not be a liability, but be reincorporated and converted into a supplemental source of nutrition, and then have that be redelivered into the shrimp, resulting in lower FCRs and lower feed costs and higher production. Um, and then three, the inhibition of pathogenic microbes. If we're going to have this flock and all this organic activity, we are begging for Vibrios to come and destroy all these shrimp. So to have bioflock agents, photosynthetic agents in there that are constantly suppressing pathogenic microbes, either coercing them to have more benign behavior by wiping them out completely. Uh, it's important to always make sure that our bioflock agents are safeguarding against disease. Talk briefly about water quality management in bioflock systems. We'll talk about the various chemical production uh, faculties that our different microbes are going to be using. Nitrification, which is the conversion of ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. That will be more of our conventional uh, biofiltration agents, but also our purple non-sulfur bacteria, as well as our denitrification and our animox as well. Um, photosynthesis and heterotrophy will be conducted by our microbial, uh, microalgal agents as well. Um, and all these are ways of taking out inevitable end products, waste products of shrimp production, and then reconverting them back into other microalgal or bacterial biomass. Um, now, it's very important that we must coordinate environmental factors such as the carbon to nitrogen ratio, light, particle size, sediment buildup, carbon sourcing, aeration, community composition, etc. And so if we contextualize all these factors, we can make sure that our photosynthetic microbes are producing uh, basically the highest level of nutrition that they can. Uh, you know, for instance, acute nitrogen starvation can make a chlorophyte make more PUFAs. Same thing can be said if you give a diatom more blue light. So if we can reconcile uh, those different environmental factors with the production needs of the shrimp and, of course, the cost, a lot of power there. A few example studies when it comes to maximizing water efficiency. Um, Gatun et al. 2021 used immobilized tetracelmus cells to strip shrimp aquaculture wastewater and was capable of, he reported 90%, I, I talked him down to 80% just to be safe, of all of their ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, and soluble reactive phosphorus within 48 hours. So the capacity of this tetracelmus agent, if well concentrated to really strip out all these waste products was demonstrated there. Same thing with Anaclops oculata. Uh, the, this uh, fostered better bacterial communities, more benign bacterial communities that markedly resulted in reduced nitrate and phosphate levels throughout the course of a shrimp bioflock system compared to one that was grown without the nanochloropsis. And then uh, the study at the end, Alvaname had a survival at 8% when it was fed just a regular commercial diet control and was given an ammonia stress trial of 3 ppm, which is a decent whacking of ammonia. Um, but if the shrimp were fed a diet enriched with live Rhodosumonus palustris, um, that Rhodosumonus palustris conducted biofiltration and improved the survival all the way up to 60 to 75%, um, which is... Uh, Moving on to maximizing feed utilization, we're seeking a lower and lower feed conversion ratio, uh, hopefully something less than one. What do I mean by that? That means that if you put a pound of feed into the system, you're going to get 1.1, 1.2, 1.25 pounds of shrimp out of the system. That way uh, you're going to uh, get the most bang for your buck by actually uh, converting as much of the feed as possible into shrimp tissue. 
Uh, and this is only possible by having uh, the shrimp, uh, which has a very limited digestive uh, capability, uh, passing all that uneaten waste feed and having that recycled by all those microbes, repass up through all the pods, the ciliates, et cetera, and then re-enter the shrimp itself. Um, and that's really the key for getting those lower and lower FCRs, which boost uh, shrimp farms into higher and higher levels of economic feasibility and scale. Um, and uh, another important capability um, that we can see below in the photo is the ability to use uh, centrifugation and other methods to uh, take the bioflock, dry it and concentrate it so that even when a production cycle is over, the bioflock has the right nutritional capability uh, with the more lipids, the better. Um, it can be concentrated, dried, and then redeployed as hopefully an efficacious feed resource for uh, shrimp. So you use the shrimp, you feed the shrimp, you make the flock, and then when the culture is over, you can dry the flock and make more shrimp feed. Um, hopefully it would be the way uh, to achieve even higher levels of not only environmental sustainability and feed utilization, but economic feasibility as well. Um, and then again, discuss the ability of some of these microbes, uh, both microalgae and um, the, especially the purple and sulfur bacteria to line and occupy, actually colonize the guts and the gastrointestinal systems of the shrimp so that they can enhance digestion and at the same time uh, produce substances that provide immunostimulation and kind of this atmospheric uh, alarm bell that improves, improves both the shrimp's health, uh, getting all these enzymes and nutrients from their symbionts, but also constantly getting those warnings and always having more immune competency as well. So really all these things combined um, can really have really effective qualities that will enhance um, really premium Vaname feeds and boost them to the next level. Uh, if they're going into feeding not only shrimp, but dynamite, uh, photosynthetic, bioflock, microgrid sources as well. Some important nutritional considerations specifically, uh, the proteins, we're going to need to have the essential amino acids, not only for the shrimps, but um, the more amino acids that build up in the shrimp's tissues, the better uh, all these all the proteins um, and everything else is for the consumer, the human that eats the shrimp itself. So we want the lysine, histine, arginine, threonine, methionine, cysteine, phenylalanine, isoleucine, leucine, and valine um, to support all of the essential amino acids of the shrimp. So to have photosynthetic uh, bioflock agents that have those, that would be good. Um, of course, always the polyunsaturated fatty acids, arachidonic acid, uh, EPA, DHA, these are absolutely essential for the health and long-term well-being of all marine organisms, but they are also substantial uh, nutritional assets for the humans that consume these organisms, and the more that they can have uh, in their tissues, the better. Uh, but it cannot be understated that highly unsaturated fatty acids and even saturated fatty acids are also important because uh, shrimp are designed to be taking in this lower quality lipid forage and elongating it and desaturating it um, into the higher stuff. So it's important as well uh, to reconcile the, the end product and its nutritional capabilities with also the needs of the shrimp during the production cycle. Uh, also of note are the carotenoids. These are fat soluble. Um, they facilitate oxygen transport, they buffer against free radicals, and they manifest as these fantastic colors uh, in the shrimp's tissue, um, and they are absolutely uh, positive contributions to the humans that consume them as well. And then it's very important to note that, uh, that shrimps cannot synthesize cholesterol de novo, and they must um, receive it through the diet, and that is greatly swayed by the protein and lipid source of that diet. So it's very important that these uh, photosynthetic agents provide uh, some uh, of the cholesterol needs of the shrimp as well. Quick photo of a conventional shrimp diet to uh, give a hint at the level of complexity that's contributed to the, the feed itself as, of, as well as the other things that might be provided slash uh, recycled and buffered by the Bioflock Micro Consortium. Some examples of bioflock nutrition enhanced through the addition of photosynthetic microbes. Um, these authors below um, demonstrated that bioflock cultures, which were inoculated by various genera of diatoms, Catosphora, Thalsoria, Navicula, Gramatophora, these contained higher levels of PUFAs, 
um, and carotenoids such as, as astaxanthin. So increase the nutritional asset load of those bioflocks. Uh, same thing with AL vaname fed with supplemented diets with nanochloropsis. Um, they presented higher resistance to thermal shock and resistance to reactive oxygen species. So it really did increase the nutritional uh, capabilities and manifested in the, the, the stress uh, characteristics of that crop. Um, and then the, the last study, uh, diets uh, with five grams of Rhodocinomonas palustris uh, supplemented um, outcompeted a control diet, uh, both in terms of the average shrimp weight and in the more importantly, arguably in the overall feed conversion ratio um, in which uh, the R palustris really helped um, drop that down. I won't go through this, this whole quote, quote, but most importantly is the end where you can reflect that the different diets of the shrimp, even to the degree of whether or not the diet is predominantly highland saturated fatty acids versus polyunsaturated fatty acids, all these things manifest in the end characteristics of the product, which is at the end of the day, the most important thing, that the product has that sweet aromatic aroma, the umami flavor, the higher first bite moisture release, and in all these things that are looked for in arguably the perfect shrimp, something that once consumed by the average consumer, will they'll never look back. And for that on forward, they'll always be hooked on a premium shrimp product. These are the things that must be considered all the way uh, from the microbial baseline level. The last major important criteria for the ideal bioflock agent is their ability to safeguard against disease, most notably uh, pathogenic uh, Vibrio strains. But uh, it must it is very important to establish a complex bioflock community that is stably functional. That way there's minimal niches for opportunistic uh, and therefore pathogenic uh, bacteria and pests. You know, if there's no room in the city, uh, it's very difficult for people to move in and wreck the place and reproduce. Um, you can see manifestations here where there's Vibrio being grown on plates. Uh, very often uh, during the production cycle, shrimp will be sacrificed and their hepatic pancreases will be uh, used to uh, inoculate these plates to see how much Vibrio and of what species is, is forming. Um, and there can be grave consequences if Vibrio uh, erupts, uh, including huge crop losses and um, also producing product which might not necessarily be safe for human consumption. Um, so there are various reasons why we want to keep Vibrio knocked back in its place, and that's why we have these different photosynthetic microbes uh, that can do different things, uh, such as uh, do quorum inhibition, so it's like interrupting how microbes talk to each other and how Vibrio becomes virulent by talking to the different Vibrio cells by producing antibiotics to fry those suckers directly and by producing biofilms that can inhibit their ability to colonize structures such as uh, shrimp organs. Um, and then also, if we have benign microbes that aren't causing disease, they provide atmospheric levels of amino stimulation through compounds such as lipopolysaccharides, peptinoglycans, uh, beta-glucans, and phenyloxidases, all these things constantly telling the shrimp, oh, there's critters about. And that's why we, uh, we don't have boy in the bubble shrimp. We have shrimp that are worldly, shrimp that are tough, shrimp that are able to uh, resist uh, Vibrio outbreak, outbreaks uh, when they happen. Some specific examples of inhibition of pathogenic Vibrio uh, with these different uh, photosynthetic agents. Uh, in uh, Wittawati et al., 2018, uh, Vibrio alginolycus and Harvey uh, in uh, L. vanimes hepatopancreas. Um, they were taken out and decreased after 21 days being Feldunelia and Tetracelmus. So there is some sort of immuno simulation or direct microbial combat that might be happening there uh, that caused that direct correlation. Um, Isochrysis galbana uh, has been known to synthesize uh, antibacterial fatty acids in concentrations that will inhibit the growth of Vibrio alginolycus, Cambelli, and uh, Harvey as well. Uh, very interesting that if you have a robust Isochrysis galbana uh, culture or activity in the tank, perhaps uh, you will have uh, suppressed populations of these pathogenic strains of Vibrio as well. And then um, very uh, uh, damning, in my opinion, is all these uh, different uh, purple non-sulfur bacteria strains, which 
in agar, agar plate trials, and in following up uh, feeding trials with Alvaname actively suppressed Vibrio parahemolyticus, which is possibly one of the nastiest of the Vibrios, and Cambelli. Uh, so a lot of promise in actively deploying, deploying a microbial army to make sure that pathogenic Vibrio is always knocked back in its socks. A few conclusions. Uh, utilizing biofluct technology for aquaculturing species such as Lidopinaeus vanames will allow nations that are non-conventional shrimp producers to produce shrimp indoors, inland, with no need of being on coastal properties. You can build one in the middle of Kissimmee, Florida. You could build one in the middle of Detroit. You could build one in a shopping center in Belchertown, Massachusetts. You do not need to have uh, coastal land. Uh, you can rely on localized labor. Um, and this allows uh, nations that are not do not have access to coastal land and do not have warmer climates the possibility to produce shrimp indoors and provide their populations and their local areas uh, a nutritious uh, seafood source um, that is locally produced. And this is, allows uh, the United States and other nations to produce uh, to pursue this greater level of seafood independence. Um, now. Uh, the key to having this uh, be successful is economic feasibility. Um, and that is because, and that's where the photosynthetic agents come in for being able to mitigate uh, toxic waste and being able to replace that with supplemental nutrition, drop FCRs, increase feed and water utilization. Um, and by these means, uh, biofluct technology will make uh, shrimp production economically feasible. And the fact that shrimp are delicious and the fact that the shrimp will be amazing will make that culturally feasible. Um, and uh, by technological feasibility going hand in hand with cultural acceptance and re-embrace of this delicious seafood product, um, the United States and other nations uh, will strive towards ever and ever greater seafood independence. I'll end this presentation by saying I believe in USA shrimp. I believe that shrimp is delicious. I believe Americans love shrimp. I believe everyone in the world, if they try a good shrimp, will love a shrimp. And I believe everyone in the world should have the ability to uh, produce a shrimp locally in their own country if they would like. And uh, thank you so much for listening. And um, I appreciate everyone at the University of Florida and uh, everyone that provided photos for this presentation as well. Thank you so very much.